let us continue with our study. Today we go on to the Asachi Sutta. Now this uh, the title is very short here because we only have this sutta by this name. And this is uh, in the S22.8, Sangita Nikaya, chapter 22, Sutta 88. And this is found in the Sutta Discovery, volume 42.8, ST42.8, the Asaji Discourse. <clears throat> Here is an account of this monk called Asaji who has difficulty meditating. Uh, we, we have quite a number of cases of such monks who have difficulty meditating and the Buddha helps them. Some of the famous cases include those of Mokalana, for example, in the Pachala Sutta. And you have Anuruddha in Anuruddha Sutta. And then you have Megiya Sutta and so on. So uh, these were the, the great saints who at first couldn't meditate. So the Buddha gave them different kinds of advice. And uh, all this became very famous suttas, teaching us meditation. In fact, such suttas can be called case studies because they actually relate to real people with real problems in meditation. This sutta is also interesting because there are, some, there are a few problems related to it. We're not really sure who Asaji is here. In fact, uh, from my research, we can say that there are three Asajis at least. The, the first Asaji, of course, is the, the most famous, the Asaji, the youngest of the five monks, Kundanya, Wapa, Badia, Mahanama, and Asaji. And, uh, they were the ones who first attended to the Buddha and then became the five monks who listened to the first two discourses and then became Arahats. So here we can call him Asaji One, the first Asaji. We're not sure whether it's the same Asaji or not. If you look at the Sutta, because of the, the timing and so on, if you look at the start of the sutta, you find it's a different location. The sutta opens in section one. It says, at one time, the blessed one was staying in the squirrel's feeding ground in the bamboo grove outside Rajagaha. OK, this location is problematic in the sense, uh, uh, in terms of the name Asaji. Because we can't say he's the first of the five monks, because during the teaching of the first two discourses, the bamboo, bamboo grove was not available to the monks yet, not available to the Buddha yet. The bamboo grove was given to the monks and to the Sangha by King Bimbisara only in the second, minister, second year of the ministry. And then uh, after that, the Buddha spent the second wasa, second retreat there. So this uh, Asaji discourse must have recorded events that came after that, came after the first discourse, the first two discourses have been given. <coughs> then secondly, if you look at the second verse, now at that time, the Venerable Asaji was dwelling in Katsapaka's park in pain, grievously ill. Okay, so we have a sick man here. And this park, Katsapaka's park, or Katsapa's park, is said to have been built by the, the set, or the uh, entrepreneur, or what you call a financial banker, if you like by the name of Kasapa. We don't really know who he is. This only place is mentioned. This only place where Kasapaka's park is mentioned. So anyway, the point is, this is definitely not in the Deer Park, in Isipatana of Sabinaris. 
So if that's the case, we're not sure that we're talking about the same Asaji here. So there are probably two different Asajis. In that case, we will call the Asaji of this Asaji Sutta S22.88 as Asaji number two, Asaji two, right? Now there is a third Asaji, and he's not a very good man. In fact, he's a notorious uh, leader of a group of rather bad monks who, for some reason, habitually do bad things. And he and uh, he has a partner called Puna Basu, and then these two they kind of cause a lot of problems and uh, they break a lot of rules and so on. So this is Asaji number three. Of course, you don't have to bother about this third Asaji. The uh, question is, well, Asaji one and two are they the same or not? Uh, now, let's just talk just historically about the, the first Asaji. Asaji number one, the five of the five monks, he kind of uh, followed Kundanya. Kundanya is the senior most of the monks, and in fact, he's the, might say the oldest of all the monks, uh, probably older than the Buddha. He went to attend the Buddha's birth, and also uh, the, the naming ceremony, and he was sure he was the only one who put up one finger and he's the youngest of all the Brahmins there. And he put up one finger and, and predicted that the child's daughter will become, will leave the family and renounce the world and become the great teacher, the Buddha. So in other words, we have this uh, person, this Kuntanya, who is spiritually linked to the Buddha right from the earliest time. So understandably, the Buddha declared him as Ratanyu. Ratanyu means, uh, literally it means one who knows the knights. Rata means knights. It is the ancient Indian way of uh, saying days. We today we rather say days, many days, okay? a long time in other words. So Ratanyu, one who knows uh, the days, many days, or sometimes asserted as the eldest or the oldest of the monks. It's not the, uh, what do you call, the cinemas of the monks in, in the sense of, uh, uh, of Wasa, but his cinemas in the sense of, my understanding is that of his age, he's very old. I mean, he's been there since the, the Buddha, let's say if the Buddha was born, he probably might be at least uh, 18 years old or older. So you find uh, he's kind of 18 years, or maybe longer, 20 years, maybe older than the Buddha. So we can say he's the oldest of all the monks in that sense, you know, Ratanyu. So, uh, and he followed the career of uh, the young Siddhartha, and then when, when, when Siddhartha leaves home, he renounces the world, he's kind of very happy, he expected it, and he tried to get the other Brahmins, uh, the other eight Brahmins are very wise to, to join him, but many of them have died. So he managed to get their sons, the other four monks, to join him. And the youngest of these other four monks is Asaji. Okay? So that's the background on, on the Asaji number one. And as we know, Asaji is also very famous, this Asaji number one, as a very humble teacher. Uh, he was going on Armstrong one day and then Sariputta sees him walking very peacefully. And Sariputta invites him to teach. But he says he's not ready, he's very new and so on. But on Sariputta's insistence, he gave a verse, a four-line verse to Sariputta. Upon listening to this famous verse, whatever states that arise from causes, there are causes that the Tathagata has told. And they're ending to thus spoke the great ascetic. Ye dhamma hitu papawa, te san hitu tata gato aha, te san chayo ni rodo, e wang wa di maha samano. On hearing just the first two lines, Sariputta becomes a stream and then goes on to tell, relay the same verse to Mughalana, and Mughalana too becomes a stream and 
carrying just two lines. Then later the Sankuta Mokalana go to see the Buddha, renounce the one, become the two chief disciples. So Sariputta is eternally grateful to Asaji for bringing the Dhamma to him. And it is said Sariputta always lives with his head in the direction of Asaji. So that is Asaji number one. Asaji number one is also famous uh, because he appears in the Shula Sachaka Sutra where he teaches this great debater Sachaka the same teachings as in the Sutta, same teachings as in the Anatalakana Sutta. Apparently, this Asaji, in fact, uh, Asaji one, Asaji two, they have the same teachings. Uh, Asaji one is uh, he was there present in the Buddha's teaching of the Anatalakana Sutta, and if you look at the teachings given here, the teachings are identical. They are about the five aggregates, the three characteristics of the five aggregates. So this is a very interesting uh, situation where you have the same teachings, and he also teaches the same teachings to such a kind. Now, such a kind of uh, simplicity suggests uh, kind of a, a very early time when the Buddha's teaching were kind of not very uh, complicated, not very systematic, very simple and uh, lots of repetitions of teachings because uh, the teaching was still very new. Right? So this seems to suggest Asaji 1 and 2 uh, could be the same person. Then the problem is, what about the place? How come it's, you know, we have two different places? Well, the, the places could have been uh, mentioned or located by the later uh, reciters. Sometimes the reciters are not very sure of the location, so they kind of uh, they, they try to guess which is the most likely place, and they will mention probably in this place. Of course, for for Dharma practitioners, these are not really important because, the, as you know, the, the location of teaching could be anywhere, I and mean, it is in this world anyway. What's important is the teaching themselves. So such problems would be more in the interest of the religious historian, if you like. But for the meditator, they're more interested in the actual teachings rather than where the sutta is located. Of course, uh, knowing where the sutta is located also gives us clues, a, a bit of the time, who is involved, and so on, if we care to do some detective work in the sutta, which, is, which can be very interesting, of course. And uh, if you read the introduction carefully, you'll find some of those uh, detective work being done in this introduction here too, to chapter 8 here in the SD42. Um, now the question is, uh, what other possibilities are there? Okay, we, we can say that uh, another possibility is that the teachings of the first and second discourses, they were forgotten after a long time, because we're talking about 45 years of the uh, Buddha's public ministry. The Buddha taught for 45 years, moving around all over central India. And then there, there were other monks also teaching, and they also went all over central Gangetic Plain and even beyond. And the five monks, as you know, Kundanya was very old, and the five monks, the other four monks, of course, they also would be very old definitely by, say, 20 years later and, and by, during the second period, during the last 25 years, we can be sure those monks were very old. And these early arhats, they have the habit of living solitary lives. So it, it is unlikely that we might find them mingling with the young monks, with, with this crowded community of monastic uh, inhabitants living in the burgeoning monasteries. But my, my point is that uh, maybe they slowly forgot the actual first, uh, the teachings of the first discourse and second discourses. So one way to find out, of course, is to question the five months. But this happened, the, this meaning the, the compilation, the recital of the suttas is traditionally said to have happened during the 
the convening of the first Buddhist council about three months after the what you call the, after the rains uh, after Buddha passed away. We can simply say within a year of the Buddha's passing, the first council was held or some kind of gathering was held to recite the Buddha's teaching. Maybe when they gathered together under Mahakasapa according to Theravada tradition, then they, they realized that no one there remembered the first two discourses, the first three discourses, or the first few discourses. So they had to kind of question the, the oldest monks amongst them. I'm sure many of them remembered many teachings, but it's possible they couldn't remember the first two discourses. So uh, if that's the case, then they, they kind of maybe discuss among themselves what's likely to be the actual uh, teaching given. So they came to the conclusion it must be, in the case of the first discourse, you know, the declaration of the two extremes, the middle way, you know, the Eightfold Path, and the Four Noble Truths. This reflects the, uh, the situation in Buddha's time and also the basic teachings that uh, they see as essential. And then the, the second discourse goes into more specific teachings, that is the three universal characteristics of the five aggregates, a little bit more uh, psychological. So, of course, uh, it is possible that they could have met one of those five monks, and all they need is just to meet one of the five monks and, and get his information. It could well be Asaji, but Asaji, remember, was the youngest of the monks, the five monks. So, understandably, Asaji's discourse here deals with the uh, three characteristics of the five aggregates, which also the, the very same uh, topic of the second this course called the Anatta Lakana Sutta. Another the third possibility is this. Uh, maybe Asaji was not present or he could have passed away, we're not sure. But his students, his students remember this teaching. And maybe one of the students was called Asaji. Or maybe a certain monk was sick. Then later the reciters remember him as Asaji. And uh, they remember this teaching given to him, the sick monk. Or, of course, there is also the possibility that uh, both the teaching of the second discourse and what is given to Asadi II, the, the sick monk, are the same teachings. There's nothing surprising here because we're talking about 45 years of the Buddha's teaching, a lot, a lot of uh, teachings going on, a lot of uh, suttas were taught, a lot of uh, doctrines were given. It is not surprising that many of these teachings, especially the key teachings, get repeated many times. I mean, we, we can't be thinking of new topics every time. Usually, we, we, would like to, we have to teach the same doctrines, maybe in different ways. But in this case, uh, we have to understand that when you teach Dharma, it's not just the teaching itself, it's how it is given. Or you might even say in, in modern terms, who is giving it. Uh, it's not a very good way of saying, using who here, because who has the idea of like a personality, fixed personality. So it's better to say how it is given. How did this teacher give this teaching? Is this teacher calm? You see, uh, elderly, you see advanced in his meditation, you see a saint, you see an arhat. So you can imagine if there's an arhat is teaching even the simplest of suttas, you have a very profound impact on the audience. So a lot of suttas get repeated in other words. So it's no coincidence if you get, uh, I mean it's, it, it's a wonderful coincidence if, if you have the teaching of the second discourse, Anathalakana Sutta and the Asri Sutta to be the same teaching. It's no big deal, as they say. So this is some of the interesting uh, detective work we need to consider to see uh, the history, if you like, of the Sutta. But like I said, ultimately, uh, we have to study the Sutta ourselves to, for our own practice and awakening.
Right, so coming to the sutta, the Asaji Sutta S32.88, it's about Asaji is very sick and uh, he sends a monk to inform the Buddha he's very sick, but he's afraid that he might die, so he's, he feels he should take leave of the Buddha. Uh, then he tells the Buddha he has a regret, and the Buddha says, what is it? And he says, he's not able to meditate. So then the Buddha teaches him this teaching. The Buddha teaches him the uh, three characteristics of the five aggregates. Of course, if, if we use our imagination a little bit, we stretch our imagination a little bit, this could possibly happen during the first year of the Buddha's ministry too. Maybe the Buddha, the, the newly enlightened Buddha, taught Asaji by himself and he was sick. But I think it's unlikely because we know, according to the records, uh, Kondanya was taught and then they, they, the, the rest were taught in pairs. Apparently, no, probably except for Kondanya, the other two months they were taught together. So we have little puzzles like this. Um, but the point is, Pasaji says he has, has difficulty meditating and the Buddha teaches him the Dharma in terms of the three characteristics and he's able to meditate. So the point of, of this sutta, another point is that you need to go into deep meditation, especially to attain jhanas or dhyana to become an arahat. To become an arahat, you need dhyanas. But for attaining stream winning and once return, you don't need. You need some mindfulness, some calm, constant reflection, say, on impermanence. So, now we, we do have another interesting problem about just about listening to the Dharma and becoming enlightened. For example, we have the case of Sariputta and Bahia Daruchiriya, who actually, who, who seem to be only have heard the Buddha, right? And became arahats. So the Buddha was fanning the Buddha, standing behind the Buddha, and the Buddha was teaching his nephew, Diga Naka, as recorded in Diga Naka Sutta, and the teachings of our feelings. And as he listens, becomes an arhat. Then you have the case of Bahia Daruchiriya. The, the Buddha speaks of uh, what's called the Bahia teaching, which is the same as the Malunkya Buddha teaching. The Buddha says something like, uh, this is Bahia, Whatever is seen, there's only the seen. Whatever is heard, there's only the heard. In whatever is sensed, there's only the sense. In whatever is cognized, there's only the cognized. And that sort of teaching, bringing arahatwood to Bahia, doesn't mean that they just listen and they're able to meditate. Especially in the case of Bahia, because it seems as if that's the first time he goes to see the Buddha and, and probably doesn't know any meditation. Of course, the, the, there's a possibility that uh, Bahia could have learned some meditation before that from other monks. We are not given the details. Then later he meets the Buddha. The, the case of Bahia, of course, is very special, even unique. So problematic also, you can say. But if you are to follow the, the teachings, the traditions, and the pattern of uh, awakening given to us in the suttas, Sariputta definitely has known some meditation. He has been meditating uh, for, for this uh, a week or so. Uh, then, in the Bahia Darutira, we are not sure, but possibly he did some meditation too. So the rule is that they should know some jhanas, or they're already by nature uh, meditators, and they're very calm, and their minds are really peaceful and clear. So the moment they hear the Buddha teaching, they just get it right away, and they awaken on the spot, as it were. But we must remember, all those preparations they had made, not only in this life, but in previous lives too. Of course, if you want more details, you can look up the Bahia Sutta itself in, in this SD series and uh, Digajana Sutta in the Majjhima which is also translated in this same series. Okay, let us go into the Sutta now. Uh, 
my pitch is 43. What is your pitch? 42. The old book is page 42. The new one is 43. The Asaji discourse has 22.88. At one time, the Blessed One was staying in the squirrel's feeding ground in the bamboo grove outside Rajagaha. So this refers to a time, at least uh, from the second year onwards. Now at that time, the Venerable Asaji was dwelling in Kasapaka's park in pain, grievously ill. Now once it, it, this kind of sickness is mentioned, it, it does possibility the person may die. Then the Venerable Asaji addressed his attendants. Kama Wuso approached the Blessed One, pay homage to him in my name with your head at his feet and say, Pante the Manga Soji is sick, suffering gravely ill. He pays homage to the Blessed One with his head at his feet. Then say, it will be good, Pante, the Blessed One would visit the Manga Soji out of compassion. So here, it's, it, because he is not able to travel, he's not able to move to see the Buddha, he invites the Buddha to come, to take leave as it were, or get some instructions. In this case, to get instructions. So the messenger goes to see the Buddha. The Buddha consents by his silence. Then, section 6, we see the Buddha visiting Asaji. Then the Blessed One, having dressed himself and taking rope and bow, visited the Venerable Asaji. Then the Venerable Asaji saw the Blessed One coming in the distance and stood on his bed. He says, he's like he's going to get up, he's going to prepare himself to bow to the Buddha. Now here we see the Buddha's compassion and common sense, if you like. Then the Blessed One said this to him. Enough, or it's all right, Asaji. Do not stir upon your bed. There are these seats, bright and ready. I will sit down there. The Blessed One sat down on the spread seat. So here we know that all the seats ready in the monk's residence because the Buddha can come anytime. This is like, this is, in a sense, this is the origin of the Buddha shrine. Originally, the Buddha shrine is just a seat, a space uh, set out or, or reserved in the most uh, prominent, auspicious uh, spot, usually right in front of the, uh, the door against the wall, the, the main position, if you like, the teacher sits there and he, he can see the doorways, which the, the light shines on him, and uh, we sit at the side. That's where we usually put our shrine nowadays, but I think we've forgotten the original significance of this. It's, it's meant for the Buddha to sit as it were, and when the teacher comes, we welcome him, uh, we, we honor him, and of course we get teachings from him and so on. So there, there, there's the Buddha sitting there and the interview starts. Session 9. Sita Das, the Blessed One, said this to the Venerable Asaji. I hope you are bearing it, Asaji. I hope you are getting better in your pains and are abating, not rising. That their abating is evident, not their rising. So here we see the Buddha asking a simple mundane questions. Are you okay? Are you alright? How are you feeling? So you can see the Buddha here is a very compassionate person. And Asaji replies, Bhante, I cannot bear it. I am not getting better and my pains are not abating, but rising. The arising is evident, not the abating. Now here again we see this monk is not treated by any doctor. So you might say that uh, Dr. Jivaka hasn't come to the scene yet. So this, this poor monk is suffering by himself. Maybe even the rules about uh, the monks keeping their own medicine has not been promulgated even, so we're not sure. But it's just mentioned this monks get, also is very sick and his sick is getting worse. Then the Buddha asks a second question. I hope then, Asaji, that you are not troubled by remorse and regret, right? So it's as if uh, Asaji, you know, can never know if he hints that he's dying. So the Buddha says, I hope you, you don't have any any things you're worried about, remorse, regret. Indeed, Bhante, I have a lot of remorse and regret, right? So normally a monk wouldn't say this. Yeah. In fact, whenever this question is asked, in the other case is that of Wakali, you find the answer is the same. That Wakali too says, I have remorse and regret, and they will tell why. 
then the Buddha is going to ask one more question. The third question the Buddha asks is, section 12, I hope, Asaji, that you have nothing for which to reproach yourself in regard to moral virtue. Right, so the Buddha is saying, okay, your remorse and regret, I hope it's nothing to do with precepts. Right? You've not broken any precepts, have you? So Asaji, of course, says, no. He says, uh, I have nothing, Bhante, for which to reproach myself in regard to virtue. So the Buddha asks, in that case, what is it? What is it that you are uh, so troubled with? Then comes the, uh, the big question, if you like, because of which the Buddha will give his teaching. So this statement is in 13.2. Formerly, Bhante, when I was ill, I would dwell stealing the bodily formations. But now I am unable to attain samadhi. Bhante, as I'm unable to attain that samadhi, it occurred to me, now let us not fail. Now, this is a very interesting statement. Okay? Asaji says, in the past I could meditate, I could get into jhana. But now, and I could just, I could calm my body so when I'm sick I will kind of heal myself. But now apparently I can't, he says, I cannot get into the samadhi because now probably the sickness is really bad. So he's not able to uh, get into meditation. So he says, I must not fail, right? So it's kind of very determined, right? Now, so from this kind of uh, remarks, uh, you can say it's unlikely to be Asaji number one, right? So this is a different Asaji, uh, probably someone who, who comes much later after the first Asaji, Asaji number two, as we said. So the, now the Buddha's advice, section 14. Asaji, those ascetics and Brahmins who regard samadhi as their essence, samadhi as their reclusion, they did not attain the samadhi thinking thus, now let us not fail, right? So this is the first advice the Buddha gives. The Buddha says, if you're a meditator, you should not think in terms of success and failure, right? So you find even today, uh, Seasoned teachers of meditation are very compassionate. They'll tell their students that uh, there is no such thing as a bad meditation. And there's no such thing in failure in meditation. You just, what, in meditation, what you see is what you get. You, you build yourself up. And I like to use the figure of a little child, a little toddler, crawling, learning to walk, stands up, falls down stands up first night. It goes on trying to walk and in the end is able to walk. We were all that toddler once. We never gave up trying to learn to walk. So meditation is also in a sense learning to walk, learning to walk the path. So here, in other words, the Buddha is saying there's no such thing as a bad meditation. You just meditate. The action of non-action as it were. So uh, there is a very interesting, there's a whole discourse, two discourses in fact, in this connection, where the Buddha says that if you really, if you're a true practitioner, all you do is you keep the precepts well, then you don't have to worry about, oh, I want to attain samadhi, I want to attain dhyana, I want to get to this level, first jhana, second jhana, you, you don't say it's, you don't talk like that. Indeed, if you talk like that, you're not meditating, you're thinking. So these two suttas, uh, they are the Dasaka Chetana Karaniya Sutta in the Book of Eights, uh, sorry, in the Book of uh, Ten, Dasaka, and you have the Eka Dasaka Chetana Karaniya Sutta in the Book of Elevens. Chetana means volition, will, akaraniya, no need to do anything. One should not do this. There's no need for any kind of volition. You don't have to force yourself. You don't even have to will it. You just let it happen. So this is very interesting in a sense that you don't need willpower in meditation. You just sit there, let go of all will. It's like it's totally surrendering yourself. The interesting thing is there's no self to surrender. Once we realize there's no self to surrender, you're on the way to getting peace of mind. Meditation is that simple as it were. So that's why such sutta teachings are very important to us because they tell us the spirit of the meditation. It's not learning all the kinds of different techniques, 
learning management things and putting them together, it doesn't work that way. It's letting go of all views, letting go of all willpower and effort, just letting go, renunciation, that you attain levels of peace and deeper levels of peace and clarity. Then the Buddha goes on with his teaching, the three universal characteristics of the five aggregates. And this is what is identical with the teachings in the second discourse, the Anatta Lakhana Sutta, and also the teaching that Asaji gives to Satchaka. So notice here, you see the headings, the aggregate characteristic formula, and then the next section, big section, the non-self-totality formula, and then the last part of the instruction is the revulsion and liberation. Okay? And there, was, there is a bit of some of the teachings at the end. We'll come to that in a moment. So these are teachings which we need to listen. Maybe someone re reading this during Sutra Puja, or you can record this with a very nice reflective voice, and you listen to it calmly, and then you go on to your meditation. Section 15. Now what do you think, Asaji? Is form permanent or impermanent? Impermanent, Bhante. Is what is impermanent unsatisfactory or painful? Or satisfactory, pleasurable? Unsatisfactory, Bhante. Is what is impermanent unsatisfactory and subject to change, fit to be regarded thus? This is mine, this I am, this is myself? No, Bhante. Uh, this is the most famous template for explaining the three characteristics. Right? We begin with the simplest, impermanence. Right? First of all, the easiest thing to see that is impermanence is form, physical form, material form, our body, things around us. They are impermanent. We can easily accept that whether through faith or through wisdom. Then the Buddha says, well, if, if these things are impermanent, are they Good, are they satisfactory or unsatisfactory? Do they bring suffering or not? The answer is quite natural. They are unsatisfactory, dukkha. Then the Buddha combines the two, the two universal truths. What is impermanent, what is unsatisfactory or suffering? If this is a situation, then it, can there be any essence, any kind of a fixed entity or reality, a soul? some platonic form, if you like, later times. Of course, here, this knowledge is already there in, in uh, Asaji. He says, no, no, Bante. Right? We cannot own any of these things. This, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. It doesn't work. It's totally false. And, th and the same thing goes to feeling. So it's, it's, here is if you read intellectually, then you have an idea. Say, oh, yeah, okay, the fire gets uh, like this, like that. And you forget about it, you go on to something else. So you'll be piling up lots of knowledge, but you become a library, but not alive to the Dharma. So this is where it's how we listen to the Dharma. We listen, letting go of all thoughts, letting it sink into our being, experience it directly. Then we begin to connect the dots, so to speak. We begin to see a reality out there. Then we say, yes, now I see it for myself. We need to see this truth for ourselves. So that's why it's good to reflect on this daily if you can, occasionally at least. So verse 16, now what do you think, Asaji? Is feeling permanent or impermanent? Impermanent Bhante. Is what is impermanent, unsatisfactory or satisfactory? Unsatisfactory, Bhante. Is what is impermanent, unsatisfactory and subject to change, fit to be regarded as? This is mine, this I am, this is myself? No, Bhante. And same thing goes with perception, formations, and finally, consciousness. So once th this understanding is established, the three universal characteristics of the five aggregates, then the Buddha 
next gives what is called the non-self totality formula. In other words, the Buddha now universalizes this truth. 20. Notice it starts with therefore. Therefore, it connects previous understanding to a new understanding. Therefore, Asaji, any kind of form, right? Rupa, any kind of form, and then any kind of feeling, any kind of perception, any kind of formation, any kind of consciousness. Whether past, future, or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near. Okay, this is the most complete, exhaustive uh, classification possible of the appearances or manifestation of form and the other aggregates. All forms should be seen as they really are with the right wisdom thus. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. So this is the negating of all this. Uh, the aggregates and the same thing is applied to the other four aggregates feeling perception formation and consciousness now look at this formula this is a classification of the four aggregates first according to time past present future this is true in the past this is true now this this, uh, this was true in the past this is true now and this will be true in the future, the timelessness of the Dharma. Internal, external, because here we can, one simple way is uh, internal, of course, is your own five aggregates, your own form, and so on. External is those of others. Gross or subtle, here gross uh, means uh, your physical senses and subtle is your mental aspects of it. Inferior is uh, of the sense world, superior of the jhanas. Far or near, of course, in terms of space. Those which are here in this world, or in any other universe, any parallel universe, even, they're all anicca, dukkha, anatta, permanent, unsubjectory, non-self. And but here the, the key idea is to regard all this as it really are, as non-self. This is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. This is called this owning the pain, right? Uh, the commentary gives a slightly different explanation from what I've given you. Uh, according to the Visuddhi Magga, internal means physical sense organ, external means physical sense object, kind of similar to what I mentioned just now, internal, external. Gross refers to what impinges. Here, according to Buddha Gosha, it's the physical, internal, and external senses. We touch, that is earth, wind, and fire. Uh, where subtle is that which does not impinge mind, mind objects, mind consciousness, and water. Of course, you want to know more details, you've got to look up the Musuri Maga uh, in the Chapter 14, Section 73. Now you can also look at the Vibhanga, pages 1 to 13, the first 13 pages of the Vibhanga for all this. And then uh, inferior means unpleasant and unacceptable sense experiences in other world experience. Superior are pleasant and acceptable sense experiences, form and formless existences. Far, far and near are similar to what I've explained. But here Buddha Gosha says far means subtle objects, difficult to penetrate. Near means gross objects, easy to penetrate. Okay? So these are a bit of technical details. Again, remember, in meditation, we try not to get too technical. The idea is learn something that helps you to clear your mind of thoughts. And then you go on to your meditation and with your growing clarity, and calmness, wisdom also grows, and you're able to understand better whatever you see before you. And uh, the commentators are very helpful, the commentaries are very useful, but they're not always right. In your 
meditation and realization, you might come with new insights. And that's where you begin to put things together more clearly, more effectively, more happily. Right, so we're finished with the part on the non-self totality formula. So now the, the Buddha takes us further. He says, okay, if you know all these things, then you'll be reviled at these things. You don't want to be cheated by these things. You'll be disgusted at them. You say, oh, what have I been doing all this time? You know, I've been caught up with the world. So we have revulsion towards the fire aggregates, section 21. Seeing thus, Asaji, the learned noble disciple, is revulsed or disenchanted with form, is revulsed with feeling, is revulsed with perception, is revulsed with formations, is revulsed with consciousness. You know, as we just, we, we, we're not going to run after them, we, we're not going to accumulate them, we just let them be, in other words. We don't really hate them, nor do we love them. Revulsed doesn't I mean hate here, it's, it's like you. You got burnt because you put your hand on the very hot plate and, and you draw it back. Of course, a child may be, maybe have a lot of fear, even anger towards this hot plate. But if you're wise, you don't get angry with a hot plate because you know it's the nature of the hot plate to, to burn things, especially your, your hands, your fingers, because you're feeling. So you don't hate it. You're just careful. So that's the meaning here, revolve. So you're not going to touch it again. You're very foolish on your part, not on the part of that hot plate. So that's the meaning, simple meaning of revulsed. Then, if you understand the nature of this revulsion, then of course you attain this understanding. And liberation arises, right? 21.2. Through revulsion, it becomes dispassionate. His desires are gone. Through dispassion, his mind is liberated. But the mind, our mind is imprisoned by views and ideas and desires. When he is liberated, there arises the knowledge, free am I. Or we can also say when it is liberated. It here means the mind. Yeah? There arises the knowledge, free am I. Or even uh, it's just free. Yeah? Destroy this birth. The holy life has been lived. What needs to be done has been done. There is no more of this state of being. No more rebirth, because whatever causes to be reborn is no more there. The holy life has been, you have done, you finish your training, nothing more needs to be done. So, in other words, it's like a long holiday for you. But as you know, the Arahats did not really have a holiday. They're happy every day, but they'll be teaching Dharma, practicing meditation, and so on. There's no more of this state of being. They do not have to suffer anymore. So, now what's interesting here is that there is something extra, uh, uh, something more than what is given in the Anatta Lakana Sutta. This is found uh, in such suttas as the uh, Metta Sagata Sutta and the uh, Tikandaki Sutta, where the Arahats, uh, how the Arahat responds to feelings, sense, uh, contact, and so on. Right? So here is a simplified version. The, it's called the Arahat's constant abiding. This is how the Arahats feel, if you like, or how they respond to feeling. 22. If he feels a pleasant feeling, he understands it is impermanent. He understands it is not grasped at or not coveted. He understands it is not delighted in. Right? So impermanent, no grasping, no, no delighting. For the other heart. If he feels a painful feeling, it's the same. He understands it is impermanent. He understands it is not grasped at. He understands it is not delighted in. But some people can delight in pain, for example. Right? You feel that, oh, if I'm in pain, that's good. Yeah, people will be more compassionate to me. I might get more donations, whatever. You can have a wrong idea. 
If he feels a neutral feeling, he understands it is impermanent. He understands it is not grasped at or coveted. He understands it is not delighted in. If he feels a pleasant feeling, he feels detached regarding it. If he feels a painful feeling, he feels detached regarding it. If he feels a neutral feeling, he feels detached regarding it. So here is the answer. Do our hearts feel? Yes, they do. Yes, they feel, but they are not attached to it. They just watch it come and going. It's the activity of the senses. After all, the hearts still have a body like ours, so they will feel certain uh, some basic sensations. Physical sensation, they do feel that, but they're not troubled by that. When he feels a body bound feeling, or in your, the old translation is a feeling ending with the body, he understands, I feel a body bound feeling. When he feels a life bounded feeling, he understands, I feel a life bounded feeling. Here, bounded means delimited. Uh, and this is not a very common teaching here. It seems to appear very few places in these other places. Body bounded feeling, any feeling connected with the body, okay? a physical kind of feeling. So whatever that kind of feeling, you would just say, okay, that's it. And then it's not it's still detached, it's not troubled by it. Life bounded feeling is the kind of feeling that will occur throughout our life. You might say it is a sort of a mental feeling in this case. Right? The commentary is mentioned here. Uh, body bounded feeling, kaya pariyantikan vedanam, is a feeling ending or coterminous with the body. The commentary says this means that it is a feeling delimited of the body or by the body. As long as the body with its five sense doors continue, the feeling the feelings arising there continue. This is in the Sanyutta Nekara commentary. No? A life bounded feeling, ji vita pariyantika vidana, or feeling ending or coterminous with life, commentary says this means it is a feeling delimited by life. As long as life continues, the feelings arise at the mind door, uh, at the mind door continue. Okay? So, in simple terms, the five senses and the mind. So, body bounded feeling are the feelings that arise in connection with the five, five physical senses. Uh, whereas, a life bounded feeling arises on a mental level, ideas, thoughts, and so on. So, either way, physical or mental, whatever feelings arise, the arahat is detached. He understands them for what they are. He understands with the breaking up of the body following the ending of life, all that is felt and not delighted in will be cool, quenched right here. Right? So to the Arahat says, well, once I pass away, all these bodily feelings, mental feelings will not arise again. No more rebirth. And the whole teaching concludes with the famous parable, the oil lamp. The Buddha says, Asaji, just as an oil lamp were to burn dependent on the oil and the weak, but with the exhaustion of the oil and the weak, it would be extinguished through lack of fuel. Even so, Asaji, when a monk feels a feeling ending with the body, he understands, I feel a feeling and ending with the body, or uh, what is called a body bounded feeling. I feel, I feel a body bounded feeling. When he feels a life bounded feeling, he understands. I feel a life bounded feeling. He understands with the breaking up of the body following the ending of life, all that is felt, not delighted in, will be cool right here and now. Right here, right now. Yeah? So, this oil lamp, of course, is a famous analogy. We find in the case of uh, 
toată cealaltă și și la scurt putem uh, alte oil lamp and she does that, she became a light and it's also mentioned in the Ratana Sutta right? just like a lamp yata yam, yata yam padipo just like a lamp that goes out so two person is awakened so here what the Buddha is teaching Asaji is simply to regard all this pain arising from the body or arising from the mind to be just what they are just like that, nothing more, nothing less not to be troubled by the pain, right? So, in due course, as Asaji became an awake, and the Sutta ends there. Okay, so, any questions? Okay, let us now do a short reflection. The Sutta has helped us to have a better idea of how did the Buddha and the early saints meditated and also how we can be inspired by such examples and also there are instructions which we can follow, which we should follow to improve our own meditation. When we do meditate in this way then we are practicing the Dharma in accordance with the Dharma not the way someone else has taught us or through talks and so on, but something we experience directly from the Buddha Dharma. And the Asaji Sutta is one such teaching where we can, where after reading through the Sutta, we can feel the process of mental calmness, even mental clarity, and use that for our own practice. Reflecting in this way is very good karma, but about such karma and many other good deeds we have been doing, keeping the precepts, practicing generosity, doing what we can to spread the Dharma. May we attain peace of mind and success and happiness in this life itself. Above all, by all these good deeds we have done, may we attain spiritual liberation, we aspire to stream winning at least in this life. In this moment of peace, let us radiate our loving kindness everywhere to all beings, especially our teachers. May they be well, may they be happy. To our loved ones, let them be well and happy too. And to those whom the Dharma have not touched, may they see the Dharma and be well and happy. May be our friends and workers in the Dharma. May all beings be well and happy. Sad, sad, sad.